And now joining us on Book TV is James Salzman. He is a professor at Duke, and he is the author of this book, Drinking Water, a History. Dr. Salzman, in this book, you write that unsafe drinking water is the single largest killer in the world. Yeah, I was quite surprised to find out more than warfare, more than AIDS. Uh, and in fact, um, the, the stat uh, statistics obviously are, are somewhat rough, but over half of the population in the developing world is estimated at some point will suffer from a waterborne disease. Why in 2014 do we not have clean drinking water worldwide? Is it, is it hard? Uh, it is hard, uh, and it's, what's interesting, and, and one of the reasons I, I wrote this book is that the challenges that we're facing in drinking water in 2014 uh, are, are a little different, really, than uh, B.C. 2014. Uh, the provision of safe drinking water has been a challenge for every settled society, really, throughout human history. Uh, and what's interesting is, th is that for each society, whether it was Egypt or Rome or, um, or Togo today or, or Durham, North Carolina today, uh, everyone thinks that their water is safe enough because by definition that's sort of their, their background. Uh, if we in 2014, though, were to go back 100 years, uh, we probably couldn't be paid uh, to drink some of the water. Uh, and so our, our, our very notions of safety have changed over time as well. In the U.S., do we have 100% safe tap water? No. Uh, in fact, we will never have 100% safe tap water. Uh, and in some respects, that's, that's probably a good thing because we're, we don't spend the money it takes to have 100% tap water. Um, do we have, and, and in some respects, maybe the answer should change a bit. Um, if you had said risk-free, then I would have said, no, we don't. For safe, in a sense, I, I guess we do. Uh, and, and what I mean by that uh, is really what I said a minute ago, which is we accept, we accept the trade-offs. Um, I mean, it really is quite remarkable uh, that I can go anywhere in the U.S. right now, whether it's Bangor or Tallahassee uh, or Santa Barbara, and I don't give a second thought to the drinking water, uh, which really is... Uh, is at a point, uh, historically, uh, an incredibly short period of time, right? Because for most of human history, drinking water has not been safe uh, from our perspective. But like you said, you can go anywhere in the U.S., mm -hmm. drink the water. Yep. We know how to do it. Yep. Where else can we do that in the world? Well, Nearly everywhere? Uh, in, 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 in sort of the richer countries, nearly everywhere. I mean, there are some countries that have their own sort of um, particular, particular microorganisms that our body takes some time getting used to. There are all these sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of slang terms for that. But there are other parts of the world, uh, in fact, many parts of the developing world, uh, where you really want to avoid drinking the water if you can. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is, is really twofold. Uh, and part of it is water provision and part of it is water sanitation. You know, they're two sides of the same coin. Right, so what the Romans, for example, were the first great society to, to have the insight that in order to provide safe drinking water, you need water to flush away your wastes. And so they're the two aspects uh, of the water, and that's what the aqueducts did so successfully. Uh, many developing countries don't have the infrastructure to clear away the waste, and so water sources get contaminated. I mean, one of the statistics I came across when I was writing this book that really I think is the most, um, the most fascinating statistic I've heard in years is that about a year or two ago, according to the UN, for the first time in human history, right, so the first time since apes came down from the trees, more humans live in urban settlements than in rural settlements. We have now become an urban species. And the implications for drinking water are, are huge, right, because um, providing safe drinking water in dense populations is much more difficult uh, than, in, than in more dispersed populations because of the sanitation challenge. James Salzman, is bottled water safer than tap water? Uh, in the U.S.? <laughs> in the U.S., the, an I mean, uh, the, a the answer, uh, uh, briefly, in the U.S. is there's no reason to think so. Um, now, why do people drink bottled water? I've got our own sample right here. Why do they do it? Um, turns out three reasons, right? One of them is convenience. Uh, if you go to a, a, a grocery store or to a gas station, you want something to drink, you don't want soda, you don't want something that's sugary, you, go for, you reach for the bottled water. Fair enough. Uh, although it's interesting that I, I grew up in the 70s, uh, and if I'd gone to a gas station in the 70s and asked for some water, they would have pointed me to the hose outside used to fill the radiator. And this is a very recent, recent phenomenon. So first is convenience. Second is fashion. That's actually falling a bit more, a bit more out of favor. Two, students I teach nowadays are more often will have Nalgene, these sort of you know, uh, see-through containers on their desks, than bottled of water. But the third, as you pointed out, is this notion of safety. Uh, and the reason why it's unlikely that bottled water is safer than tap water uh, is for some strange reasons, 
Um, bottled water is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration as a food stuff, essentially. And tap water is regulated by the EPA under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Tap water is much, much more rigor rig uh, rigorously regulated. There are many more tests that are done every day on tap water than on bottled water. Uh, moreover, uh, if bottled water does not cross state lines, effectively the federal government's not going to be involved, and it's going to be the states. And many states don't really regulate uh, their bottled water. Uh, and so the sort of the funny anecdotes that are related to this, so Fiji water, I'm sure you heard of. They were in an ad campaign for a while that said it's called Fiji water because it's not from Cleveland, which I thought was kind of a diss on, <laughs> on Cleveland. But there was an article that came out soon after that in the Annals of Family Medicine that compared uh, Cleveland tap water uh, to a lot of bottled water. And it turned out that about roughly a third of the bottled water contained more contaminants uh, than the tap water. They didn't test Fiji water in particular, but the, the, just because it comes in a bottle doesn't mean it's necessarily cleaner. Now, in developing countries, uh, oftentimes it is safer to drink, ta to drink bottled water, but that's a different situation. And what's the importance of fluoride in water? So fluoride has been put in um, really since the, the 40s and 50s uh, in order to strengthen the enamel on teeth. Uh, and there's been a huge hullabaloo uh, in recent years over whether this is a dangerous thing um, or not. Peer-reviewed literature says that the biggest concern about fluoridation in water is in water that already has naturally containing fluoride, it actually can lead to, to, more, to more brittle bones or to discoloration of teeth. Uh, I've not come across any peer-reviewed science that talks about links to autism, links to sort of behavioral disorders, links to neural disorders. Um, and my own view is that the, 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 the big concerns about, about fluoride, I think, fall under the same sort of um, concern that you saw really in the 1950s, which is the notion uh, of liberty and autonomy, in the sense, uh, a concern that the government is doing something to your body over which you have no, no control. And so if you look at the sort of the early scares about fluoride, even before Dr. Strangelove, uh, it's, it's basically linked with vaccines, it's linked with mental, um, with mental health programs, and it's that this concern over, over kind of a big brother. Um, you know, fluoridation is one of those issues that, that certain people feel about very deeply, but the peer-reviewed literature doesn't suggest that it's a cause for concern. What do you do here at Duke University? I am a professor, I have joint appointments, I have chairs at both the School of Law and the School of the Environment. And what do you teach specifically? Oh gosh, uh, I teach uh, first year property, I teach U.S. environmental law, international environmental law, uh, natural resources law, administrative law. I sweep the hall sometimes when they need someone extra. <laughs> you, you teach contracts and you teach environmental law. I do, okay. I do. Um, when it comes to environmental standards, mm -hmm. where does the U.S. rank in your view? Uh, it depends on the issue, right? So historically, the U.S. has been not only a leader, but a pioneer uh, in environmental law. Uh, the U.S. in the late 1960s, early 1970s, really developed the first generation of modern environmental laws in the sense of uniform standards across the country that were enforceable, that gave citizens the right to enforce the laws, which was an incredibly um, innovative and aggressive, in a sense, concept. Um, since then, depending on the particular presidential administration, uh, some things have moved forward, some haven't. We have not had a major new environmental law in this country since 1990. Uh, and unfortunately, in, in my view, uh, environmental protection has become a partisan issue and gotten caught, in, uh, gotten caught up. Uh, in the um, in the partisanship that we see that we see in D.C. and so, for instance, you look at climate change. Um, you know, there's a lot going on at the state level, some of the states, some going on at the federal level. But if you compare that to what's happening in Europe, uh, then it's really hard to say the U.S. is a leader in that regard. James Salzman, how important was the 1974 Safe Water Act? Safe Drinking Water Act. Safe Drinking Water. Yeah. Water. Um, so, Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, it was important because it provided the first time that there were really uniform standards uh, for drinking water across the country. The more important date actually was 1914. Uh, and 1914 was when the Interstate Commerce Commission required that common carriers, interstate common carriers, trains, buses, had to use chlorinated water. Chlorination of water, adding chlorine to water, was probably the single most important uh, public health action really in the history, if I, I would argue in the history of the world. Um, Dying of typhoid, <laughs> dying of cholera was commonplace uh, in the U.S., in Europe, in the 19th century. Uh, one of the Wright brothers, I think it was Wilbur Wright, died uh, of typhoid. Uh, it was not at all unusual. And these were waterborne diseases. Uh, with the addition of chlorine, the, it turns out that those, those pathogens are very sensitive to chlorine. And so the, the federal government in the early 1900s was not willing to politically dictate to